Hi everybody, in this video I'm going to step through the Valgrind lab that was assigned uh, for September 15th uh, and should have been completed by today. Uh, I know not everybody was able to finish it, uh, even if they did start it, so I'm going to go through what you should have seen in the lab and hopefully this will help you. Uh, it's important because basically every time you write a C program you need to use Valgrind. If you're not using Valgrind you're not certain that your program is correct. Valgrind helps you ensure that your program is correct. So I'm going to walk you through what you'll see when you run Valgrind. Um, but it's something you, every time you compile your code and run your code, you should probably be running it through Valgrind. Uh, because Valgrind will detect errors you did not know you have. Uh, not all of those errors will cause your program to crash or even necessarily give you a wrong output. But that's just because it's non-deterministic. It doesn't, it, when Valgrind detects errors, Valgrind is correct. There are errors and a new input or running your program in a different way or running your program on a different computer may turn those invisible errors into segmentation faults or into corrupted data. Valgrind helps us avoid those problems. So uh, anyway, let's go through the steps one by one. So I've already downloaded the Valgrind lab.zip from Canvas. You can see it here on the left. Uh, we want to copy this to Centaurus and unzip it. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. So we'll use the SCP command, the secure copy command. We're gonna copy valgrind.zip to Centaurus. So we log in as me, we give it the address of Centaurus, uh, and then we give it a colon and where on Centaurus we want it to go. The tilde is my home directory, and so we will just put this in my home directory. So when you do this, you have to log in like you do any other time. It's gonna ask me to do two-factor authentication. I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Uh, then we're gonna actually log in to Centaurus. And again, it's gonna ask me to verify again. So we'll just do that real quick. All right, now we're in. If we do LS, we can see that our Valgrind lab was copied here. Uh, now Valgrind lab contains a directory called Valgrind lab. So I am just going to unzip this zip file and you can do that using the unzip command. Likewise, you can use zip to zip a directory or a set of files back up. So you'll see I created this Valgrind lab directory by unzipping this and it put the make file and the student record.c in there. So now that we're here, let's clean up and we'll start going through the steps. So the first step is to run make to compile the code. That went well. We have a student record, a student record executable file. Uh, if we run student record, like we say in step two, we get some output. It says students, and then I assume there's supposed to be a list of students by name and age, but I don't think null is a real name and I don't think zero is a valid age. So if we look at these two entries, they look incorrect. Uh, now Bob down here, age 22, that seems reasonable. So something is going wrong here, but it kind of works. And then we get a munmap chunk, invalid pointer message. Munmap is memory unmap. This probably has something to do with free. Uh, and that gives us an invalid pointer. And then aborted core dumped is, well, this library detected something was so horribly wrong that it decided to kill your program for you instead of letting it seg fault. Uh, so our program does some weird things, does some sort of right things, and then it gets some errors and crashes. So that's what we're gonna investigate, is there's something wrong with this code. Uh, let's see what that is. Uh, so the step three, the output looks a little off. Let's look at the code and try to understand what we think it should look like. So we will open the file. Uh, now I usually would recommend you just go down the main and see how we start off. 
So if we look at main here, uh, it looks like we build a, an array of type struct student. Now for now the array is null, that's a bit interesting. It presumably count as the number of students, so we have zero students. Uh, and then you've got two calls to add student. Presumably we're gonna add Alice and Bob uh, with age 20 and 22 to our array or list of students. Now you'll notice we two weird things. One is that we didn't allocate memory for students. And two, we're gonna pass the address of students. So we expect students to be an array. We're gonna pass the address of that array, a pointer to the pointer that points to the array. Then we're gonna call display students, and then we're gonna call free a bunch of times. Now display students takes a list of students or an array of students and a count, and it looks like it iterates through them and prints them by name and age. So that's what we saw in our output. We did see this. It's just the output didn't look like it was printing the right thing. You don't expect students to have the name null. Um, and then if we keep scrolling up, we'll see we do have our struct student definition up here. It takes a name and an age, that makes sense. Uh, and then our add students, where it looks like this add student does the bulk of the work. You'll notice the parameters to add student take a struct student pointer pointer, a pointer to a pointer of type struct student, um, which is what we take down here. We had a pointer to struct student and we take the address of that pointer. It becomes a double pointer, two pointers, uh, a pointer to an array. Um, so that's one thing. And then also we take the count as a pointer. We take the name uh, and we take the age of the student that we want to add. So this function works a little bit differently than how we discussed you should write good object-oriented code in class. In particular, array is null when we pass it in. And this function is gonna allocate the memory for array if it doesn't already have it. Uh, in particular, every time we do this, it's going to allocate a new array, which is the size of the previous array plus one. Plus one is the new student that we're trying to add. Uh, once we do that, we copy all of the entries from the original array to the new array. We set up the entry for the new student after we increment count by one, which by the way, it's a pointer. So we dereference it, we do plus one, and now the count variable in main has a new value. Uh, and then we finally replace the argument array with the new array. And this is why we call, or this is why we pass a double pointer to this function. We're swapping the actual pointer in main with a new pointer that we've malloced. Uh, if it was null originally, then we're swapping it with, instead of null, now it's the new malloc. And as we call this function each time, it's gonna give it a new malloc. This is pretty slow. Uh, we make a copy of the whole array every single time we call this function. And then we add one element to it. So if we have a million students and we wanna add a million one, the million first student, we have to copy a million students then we can enter the new student. And that's pretty slow. Um, but not all code that you are given from other people is going to be good. Uh, most code is not good code. Code in industry may not be good. Uh, so it's important to learn how to read different types of code because it may not always be, the code you're given in reality may not always be good. Uh, okay. So we've read the code, we kind of have an idea of how it's supposed to work. Uh, now, if we're going into this and we're not really sure, it's not really clear exactly where the issues we're having are. Our good friend Valgrind can give us a direction to look. So let's look at number four. 
Uh, the issues we're having are almost certainly memory related. That's why we think we're doing one thing, but we're clearly not getting the result we expect. So for number five, let's try running the code with Valgrind. So Valgrind, the arguments to Valgrind are simply the arguments you would use to run your program. So in this case, we just run the program. Uh, and let's see what we get out of this. So we get a ton of output. Uh, it's actually not worth it to look at every single detail immediately. What I want to make really clear is that there are two types of error of two types of uh, issues that Valgrind detects. It detects memory errors and memory leaks. Memory errors are bugs in your program. It does not matter uh, if your output is correct. If you get memory errors, your code has a bug in it. And that output may not always be correct because of the bug. Um, so if we look at our error summary, we've got 21 errors from 14 different contexts. That means that on 14 different lines of code, we had an error. Uh, and probably six or so of those errors were repeated. It was the same error that happened multiple times. Uh, and then above that is the leak check. Uh, to be honest, don't even look at leaks until all these errors are fixed because errors are very bad. Errors mean your code has a bug. Leaks are bugs, but they are not as critical. Not every program even suffers from leaks, but also they're much easier to fix if you know your program is otherwise correct. Memory errors are logical errors. Leaks are just, I forgot to call free. Um, so these latter ones can make it, these, these memory errors can even interfere with your leak check. If your program is crashing, you're going to get a lot of leaks because your program is going to detect that you never called free. You didn't call free because your program crashed. So it's possible you don't have leaks, uh, but memory errors are giving, causing you to have invalid reports. Anyway, uh, whenever we want to use Valgrind to debug, every one of these entries we see here is a bug. So we just need to step on in and debug them from the ground up. When you do this, you always want to scroll to the top. Um, the errors of print as they occur, they happen chronologically. The first error can cause downstream errors. If we fix earlier errors, it may actually automatically fix some of these later errors. So you always start at the top. It doesn't make any sense to start at the bottom. It's such a harder task. Uh, and it can be misleading. Uh, so if we look at our first error, we see invalid write of size eight. Uh, and it tells us this happened in the function add student. Function add student was called by main. And then it tells us address, whatever this is, is zero bytes after a block of size 16 out. What that means is you had some data, presumably an array or some a struct maybe, uh, that is 16 bytes large, uh, and you accessed the 17 through 24th byte. You accessed eight bytes after the 16 legal bytes. You're off by some increment. Um, and it tells us that memory for that came from malloc. So the, the allocation came from an earlier malloc call. Unfortunately, right now, that's all that we're told. Uh, now, we can actually do quite a bit of context clues from this. We know malloc was called in add student, and there's only one call to malloc in add student. So we kind of know where this memory came from. It would be good to know where the error happened though. Right now it tells us it happened at this memory address. This memory address is some line of code, um, but we don't know which because when we compiled, we did not compile with debug symbols. Um, now I've talked about this before. If you add the G 
flag to the compile line, it adds debug symbols. You can look at the man page for GCC. Of course, there's many arguments in here, so it may be a bit difficult to track it down on the fly, but if you look far enough in here, you will eventually find dash G, which will tell you what G does, and it, in fact, produces debugging information in the operating system's native format. Uh, so this is a very useful flag. Um, and there's more detail on the man page, but I won't go through it right now. So if we recompile our code now with the G flag, and then we run Valgrind again, now our data looks a little different. We can scroll back up to this first line and we get this address and then it tells us this occurred at studentrecord.c on line 37. Uh, and that was point six, is we need to build with debug symbols. Uh, now that we've done this, let's open another shell window and take a look at the take a look at the code alongside our error messages. So let me just go ahead and connect to HPC student.uncc.edu and enter my password. We'll do 2FA. We'll log in, we'll change directory to our Valgrind lab, and then we'll clear our screen. Now let's take a look at studentrecord.c. So we're being told our program performed a memory error at line 37. So if we go to line 37, we find that this is the line. Now, what's important here is we performed an invalid write of size eight. That means on the left-hand side here, we're trying to assign a new value to memory that does not belong to us. Um, there's no other possibility for this. Invalid write means we're storing a value that is illegal. In this case, we're storing data in new array at count in the dot name field, in the name field. Now, pointers are eight bytes. Invalid write of size eight. So clearly what we're doing here is incorrect. Somehow new array at count is not legal memory. Um, and actually, if we look at the next error, you also get invalid write of size four on line 38. That line 38 is right below here with age. Age is an integer, age is size four. Ah, okay, it's telling us whatever entry count is in the array, we don't actually have memory for that. We are index out of bounds, we're index plus one. Um, because we are zero, byte, zero bytes beyond the 16 bytes that were allocated for this spot. Um, something to note here, it's subtle, but you might have picked up on it. Even though this structure is eight bytes plus four bytes, um, the entire size of the structure in this case is actually 16 bytes. Your compiler sometimes adds extra bytes to the end of a struct for padding um, because of the way memory works. I'm not gonna get into the details, but sometimes a struct is a little bigger than it looks like on the surface. That's why it's important to use size of instead of just manually computing because the compiler will always do the right size, but you manually may not. All right, so this entry is bad. Hmm. I wonder why. Well, since we're one out of bounds, maybe we should look at this count plus one. Uh, let's see, we allocated space for count plus one elements. Then we increment count plus one. But let's say up here, count is two. Then we allocate count plus one, three spaces. 
Uh, and then down here, we set count equals three because we do count is two plus one. Uh, oh, and then we use count as the index. The problem here is you're saying you have three elements in the array, but also the index is three. But the only valid indices should be zero, one, and two, right? Three elements, zero, one, two, we shouldn't be using three. So what's happening here is we are incrementing count to early. We need to increment count later after we've already dereferenced this to be the last index. Um, so that's problematic. So we've moved it down. Um, let's take a look and see, let's recompile our code Let's take a look and see if that made a difference. So we recompiled it. Let's just go ahead and clear our screen. We're just gonna run it through Valgrind again. Now, things are starting to actually look a little better. Um, Alice and Bob printed out properly before we received any errors. Now, these things may not actually print in order. The, the order of standard out and the order of Valgrind messages may be out of order. So don't interpret that too strongly. Uh, the next error we get is invalid read of size four on line 50. We also get an invalid read of size eight on line 50. Well, those numbers sound familiar. Let's take a look at line 50. Line 50 is printf. Ah, well, it did say invalid read instead of write. We are reading values. Particularly, we are reading what the array at i points to and the variables associated with it. We're reading array at i dot name. We're reading array at i dot age. Eight bytes, four bytes, okay? Um, so we have another issue. Well, hmm. We know we called add students twice, but in our output, we have one, two, three students. Huh, why do we have a third student? Well, if we look at our loop over here, I should probably be less than count, huh? It should probably be less than count and not less than or equal to count. So if we change that, maybe we won't step out of bounds anymore. Maybe we won't step, well, maybe we won't step out of bounds anymore and print an entry that is fake. Well, let's give it a shot. Let's run make again. Let's run our code through Valgrind. And now we've got one error left. And so that looks good. We've cleaned this up. I don't see the bogus print statements anymore. Now we have one last invalid read of size eight. If we look at line 64, we free students at I dot name. Huh, well, this looks familiar. So zero bytes after a block of size 32 allocated. So we're off by one, we're one index after what we're interested in. Block of size 32, well, our array of two structs, each struct is 16 bytes. So one struct plus one struct is gonna be 32 bytes. Oops, we're reading from a struct that is after the end again. It's the same dang bug. Once again, we've accidentally stepped past the, the, the edge of memory. So now let's not overcount and let's try to run it, make our code again. Let's open the code. After we've made it, let's run with Valgrind again. We'll just clear our screen and run with Valgrind. Ah. 
now things look much better. Error summary, zero errors from zero contexts. If your program does not say this, if your program does not say zero errors from zero contexts, your code is incorrect. You have bugs. They should be fixed. It doesn't matter if the output looks correct. When it gets to me, it probably won't be correct. That's Murphy's Law, but uh, it can cause errors that you didn't realize. Sometimes those errors don't always show up. They usually show up at the worst possible time. Valgrind helps you avoid that situation. It detects them, whether it caused a perceivable error or not. Now, uh, let's take a look back at our handout. We've gotten through the errors. We've continued working through the errors until there are no more. Now let's look at memory leaks. So memory leaks are a bigger problem for long running programs. You can allocate a bunch of memory and not realize it. And your, let's say you write a program that sorts the contents of a file. Well, if that file is five megabytes uh, and you're running a sort operation and the worst case algorithmic complexity of a sort is n squared, then you might end up with in squared memory consumption. It might be five squared, so you need 25 megabytes instead of five megabytes. That becomes a problem when you need one gigabyte uh, or two gigabytes or 15 gigabytes. The amount of memory that you start using grows exponentially. Uh, and actually you can do even, even worse. Um, there are cases where you memory grows worse than n squared and you cause a lot of problems. Uh, when your computer runs out of memory, if we do free.h, it tells us how much memory is available. On Centaurus, you get quite a bit, 125 gigabytes. When used matches total and free is zero, your operating system will start killing programs indiscriminately to free up memory. Um, so this can happen. Uh, a lot of times this is the cause of major outages at places like Google. You had a process that ran fine for 10 years, not really, maybe not 10 years, maybe it ran fine for six months until it eventually accumulated all of the system memory one byte at a time to crash it. Or maybe your program runs, maybe your web server runs fine for about 12 hours and then it starts to freeze and crash and you have to restart it. These are common things that happen because of bugs in software. Anyway, um, we can run the program again now that we fixed the errors to fix the leaks. So let's take uh, let's take a play from our text or from our handouts book. Uh, we can give Valgrind some additional arguments. Leak check equals full. Track origins equals yes. This is saying give me all the details about the leaks. Also, tell me where the memory was allocated for the leak. You allocated it, where did it, um, where did you allocate it? That will help me identify which leak is the pro or which memory allocation is the problem. So in this case, we get, okay, definitely lost 16 bytes in one block. Now you'll notice this treats memory as errors now, memory leaks as errors now, and that's fine because we need to fix all of these too. Uh, we lost 16 bytes in one block, um, and that block was allocated here at line 21. So we allocated the memory at line 21, somehow we lost it. Let's take a look back at line 21. Let's just make sure we've got the update date file. Ah, we called malloc here. But at some point we lost the memory. Um, hmm, how could that happen? Well, the first time we call this with Alice, students is null. So we allocate some memory for students, zero plus one. Then we assign array to be this new array. Then later we call this to add Bob. When we call this to add Bob, we allocate some memory. 
Uh, and then, uh-oh, we assign it to be the new array. What happened to our previous memory allocation? We lost it. We lost the address. We replaced the address without freeing it. So you called malloc more than once, which by the way, we called it and we dropped it with 16 bytes. That's we dropped the one element array the first time we call add student. We can actually verify this. Let's test our assumption. Let's add a Carl. Carl is 43. Uh, and let's run our code again. If we run our code with Valgrind again, let's just go ahead and clear it. I predict we're going to leak 16 bytes. The original was 16 bytes, plus an additional 32 bytes. We're gonna leak 48 bytes total in two different errors. That is my prediction, if I'm right, that this malloc is the cause. And we try it and we get two errors, 16 bytes, 32 bytes. Both of them were allocated on line 21, which is this line. We do free this memory eventually, but we only ever free the last one. When we do this array swap and you replace Bob and Alice, or Alice and Bob, with Alice, Bob, and Carl, you drop Alice and Bob on the ground. And that memory is leaked. So, um, again, this code design is not great. The fact that this add student is allocating the memory for our array here is not perfect. Ideally, we would have a, a more proper type. We would implement an array list type that will do this management for us. Um, for now, we just have to make, first we have to state some assumptions. So let's go ahead and state some assumptions. Assume our array is never a stack pointer, it is null if count equals zero. Otherwise it is um, a valid malloc address from the last time we called add student. If we make that our assumption, if we just assume properly that um, this is gonna be null or a valid address from malloc, then we're allowed to do things like um, free the old array. So we could come down here and add free and free the value stored in array and then set array equal to new array. If you free null, Nothing happens. Free null is legal. So this will not be a problem even if it's the first call. So if we call make, if we run make and we run our experiment one more time, we find we get printout students name Alice, Bob, Carl, total heap usage. Hmm, heap, that's a word we've heard before. That's where our malloc memory comes from. Seven Alex, seven freeze, 1,135 bytes allocated, all heap blocks were freed, no leaks are possible, zero errors, zero context, our code works. So, uh, just to jump back to the handout, these tools are very useful. Um, you really should be using them every time you run your program, no matter what. Uh, the only time that you really don't want to use these is if you're doing something in production. If you're doing something in production, you don't want to use Valgrind. But if your program seg faults in production, you actually still need to use Valgrind and go back and debug it. So these tools are very useful. 
Uh, let's see, we forgot to free memory from an earlier Malik. We debugged that and now, by the way, keep running Valgrind until everything is fixed. Every time you make a change, run it with Valgrind again. Don't just assume it's correct. If you were right, I mean, this code I gave you is not very long. Uh, the code I gave you is, uh, I don't know, 78 lines, not even 100 lines of code. And we found three bugs that generated 21 errors. Uh, and then we also found leaks, uh, one leak that generated however many errors. Um, if you write 5,000 lines of code before you debug it, then, well, you're gonna probably not have a good time. You're gonna get 50 times, you're gonna have 50 times as much code, more than 50 times as much code. You're probably gonna have 50 times as many bugs. <laughs> So anyway, this has been our little tutorial on Valgrind. You want to use Valgrind every time. There's really no way to succeed in this class where you don't learn how to use Valgrind. Um, if you don't, uh, if you don't use Valgrind, you're just going to struggle. You're going to guess your way through bugs in your assignments. Uh, and it's not going to be a reliable way to get through your assignments. If you use Valgrind, it tells you exactly where your bugs are. And then you just have to figure out why it's a bug. That's much better than just blindly changing things. Uh, because blindly changing things is not guaranteed to eventually solve the problem. Anyway, uh, that's it for this video. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you take it uh, to heart that we should use Valgrind. We should use these tools. Uh, and we'll see you in class. Have a good one.